introducing you to the field of astrobiology this morning and none other than Dr. Graham Lau, a renowned astrobiologist. We all are aware that it is a millennium of biology. Also, it is a time for interdisciplinary science. With this thought in mind today, we are taking you to an untrodden path of astrobiology, a field still in its infancy. Earth requires, uh, sorry, astrobiology is the study of life in the universe. The search for life beyond the Earth requires an understanding of life and the nature of environments that support it, as well as planetary, stellar interactions and processes involved. To provide this understanding, Astrobiology combines the knowledge and techniques from several fields. To introduce the subject and its scope, we requested Dr. Lau for a talk who very willingly consented to oblige us. Thank you, Dr. Lau. Dr. Lau is a science communicator and a geomicrobiologist. He has done his PhD program at the University of Colorado Boulder. His graduate research has focused on characterizing the geochemistry and mineralogy of sulfur rich deposits. His study has included detections of unexpected and rare forms of elemental sulfur, as well as an exotic forms of hydrated sulfate carbonate systems. He has a background of biology, chemistry, astrophysics, and geology, which makes him most suited for scientific and historical study of astrobiology. Dr. Graham is interested in determining the role that biology may play in the formation of these rare mineral forms, as well as what these findings may mean for the search of extraterrestrial life on Mars and many others. We had been trying to figure out uh, for life on Mars for a very long time, and I'm sure this study is going to give us some insight in that direction. He's popularly known as Cosmobiologist. He specializes in public talks and blogging in an attempt to share his scientific knowledge with masses world over. He uses diverse means for communicating science with all age groups of people. He has developed a curated list of live streams, educational content, home-based experiments, and other opportunities for learners of various ages in order to utilize their time fruitfully, especially during pandemic. So here comes the customization of his uh, work, uh, depending upon the environment and the uh, conditions we are living in. His present engagements, Director of Communications and Marketing for Blue Marble Space, Research Scientist with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, Director of Logistics for the University Rover Challenge, he also incidentally hosts a, a show, Ask an Astrobiologist, which is sponsored by NASA Astrobiology Program and SagaNet. He's also research community coordinator and an affiliate member of the Network for Life Detection. Tremendous profile, very impressive Dr. Lau, I must say. There's lots to talk about him, but without any further delay, I would like to invite Dr. Lau for his talk on some topics around planetary analogs on Earth and careers in astrobiology. Over to you, Dr. Grant. Wow, uh, thank you so much. That was the most generous introduction I've ever received. Uh, I very much appreciate that. It's a pleasure to join you all. Uh, most likely this morning for many of you, it is the evening. Uh, it's uh, 8.30 p.m., 20.30 in the evening here uh, where I'm at in Colorado. Um, I'm going to share some slides here. Please do interrupt 
at any point, if you can't see my slides correctly, I am going to try to leave plenty of time uh, to have a little question and answer session to discuss some things around analog environments and astrobiology. And specifically, I'm going to speak a bit about how to find careers in astrobiology and, and in this realm of, of understanding what life is. Astrobiology is, is our, our attempt to study the origins, the evolution, the distribution of life in our universe. This picture comes from a meteorite, the Allen Hills meteorite, uh, ALH 84001. This image became famous in 1996 when a paper was released suggesting that there could be signs of biological activity from past Martian life inside of this meteorite. That really drove NASA to create the, the, the astrobiology program at NASA, and it, NASA Astrobiology. I'm sorry? Is there a question? No, Dr. Graham, okay. uh, please carry on. Okay, um, and so for me, astrobiology is really our quest to understand the nature of life. It's one of the grandest, biggest things we've ever done as, as humans. You know, since time immemorial, we've asked big questions about who and what we are and our place in the universe. And so astrobiology, much like larger fields of philosophy and cosmology, is a way for us to understand life. And I was really driven to it as a young person because I loved science fiction. I, I loved movies and video games and comic books and novels that talked about alien life. I loved science fiction horror films. I like this idea of what would alien life be like? Are there giant plant-like creatures like giant Venus flytraps that are also carnivorous and alien worlds that could eat us? Uh, are there things that can tie their entire psychological understanding into other organisms around their planet, like in the film Avatar. And so when I first started university, I wanted to study biology. Uh, and I was very interested in wildlife biology and trying to understand the wilderness around us here in our very planet, the plants, the animals, the fungi, and the many microbes out there. And I quickly started kind of finding some of these alien-like creatures that I thought were just really cool to learn about. Uh, things like the Portuguese man of war, which is a siphonophore, a colonial organism, or the deep sea giant isopod, this large crustacean that lives on the deep sea floor uh, and feeds off the fall of bodies of whales after they die and things like that. These things look alien to us and they live right here on our planet Earth. Uh, in every single talk I give, I like to include an image of the blue marble. This is one of the things that drives a lot of us is we are here now on this one planet together and we live at a very special moment in time when we are now able to leave our planet. Uh, we've now had over 600 people have traveled to space. We've sent spacecraft to other worlds and even uh, leaving the bonds of our solar system, entering interstellar space. And we are now starting to gain a better understanding of our world because of that space exploration. And a lot of us who are interested in astrobiology, we, we want to know, could there be life right here in our solar system? even? Could worlds like Venus and Mars, Enceladus or Titan or Europa, could these worlds have life in them or on them? Could they teach us of what we're looking for in life out there? For instance, Mars has been of great curiosity and fascination uh, for human beings ever since we recognized it in the night sky as a reddish looking point of light. Uh, the planet Mars has inspired people for a very long time. It's one of the first worlds where through telescopic observations, people started to wonder if we could find signs of alien life from right here on Earth. But we also have a lot of intrigue in trying to understand how to look for life on Mars and these other worlds by using places here on Earth as analogs. So an analog system, an analog environment is one of these places we can travel to here on Earth that has some characteristics that are similar to those alien worlds. This image comes from one of the astrobiology graphic histories from Aaron Gronstall, uh, where Dr. Peter Doran says that searching for life on Mars starts with searching for habitats. The trick is to find places on Earth that share some of Mars's life-threatening characteristics. And I agree with that. We are looking for places that are life-threatening, that are very different from the places we inhabit in our cities and our towns. 
But I also wonder, is it just life-threatening? Because it has to be life-supporting characteristics too. That's really what we're trying to find. What characteristics would support life in a very remote and extreme environment on Earth? And how can we use that to look for life out there? And so I'm going to quickly just kind of jump through some of these ideas of what analog environments are here on Earth and, and how we're using them in astrobiology. One of these analogs is the Atacama Desert in South America. This is the driest desert on our planet. Uh, and it's a region where even though it's so very dry, we still find life in the soil. If we find living things, they're far more scarce, but we find them. And sometimes it rains and that provides an environment where life can bloom for a short period and then have several years of dryness. There are regions in the Atacama that even remind us of some sites on Mars. Uh, on the left here is one region in the, in the Atacama uh, in Yungay, whereas on the right is an image from Viking 2 of this strewn field of boulders here. And it looks very similar here in the Atacama Desert. We have similar characteristics, both life-threatening and life-supporting in the Atacama and on Mars. And when we look at Mars, we see that reddish coloration and we see the red on its surface from our rovers and our orbiters. The red is caused by iron oxide, the rusting of the surface of Mars. And there are some really great analog environments right here on our Earth for us to study from around the world. One such site is called Rio Tinto, where acid rock drainage or acid mine drainage is occurring, driving the proliferation of a, an acidic environment in this river called the Rio Tinto, uh, which also then has a lot of iron. And so you see this iron oxidation, this red coloration, just like on the surface of Mars, but here you might notice there's plenty of plant life around. We find this all over where some plants and microbes, other organisms can thrive in these acidic systems, telling us that, that life can find a way. Life loves to thrive in these very remote and difficult places to find a living. As a geochemist and a geologist, I, I find acid mine drainage systems uh, specifically kind of intriguing. Uh, we humans have been going into the ground for millennia to dig up minerals, to dig up metal ore, to create tools and weapons, to build our great buildings and our great works. And so we have all these, all these historical mines through time where we have mined and left things behind that have allowed for these acid rock drainage, acid mine drainage systems to develop. Uh, we have instances here in Great Britain where the, the Romans, when they, they were in Great Britain over 2000 years ago, had mined and that left behind a long-term acid mine drainage system. Um, and so these are areas where in the subsurface, water with oxygen from the surface are meeting ores of sulfide and through a geochemical process are creating heavy metals and high acidity. It can also change the environment and change the ecosystem. It can kill off fish and other things. But as I mentioned, there are still many living things that thrive in these systems for us to study. And, we find these systems all around the planet, everywhere where humans have mined. And there's also acid rock drainage sites around the planet. And all of these are good analogs for us in our studies of what to look for on Mars. They provide the mineralogy, the chemistry that's very similar to what we see on the Martian surface. And they also present, present environments that very likely existed in the ancient past on Mars when there was still water flowing. Another Martian analog is my field site in the Canadian High Arctic at Borup Fjord Pass. Um, this is at 81 degrees north. It's in a valley between two mountains uh, on either side. Uh, in this image in the far distance, if you look really closely, you can see some orange dots back here. Um, that's our, our field camp um, where we're doing some research. And what I'm standing on here, you might notice the red coloration, the orange coloration of the rocks around my feet in this picture, uh, just like an acid rock drainage and acid mine drainage, we have a system here where oxygen and water are causing ore of sulfide to be weathered and creating this acidic mineral system rich in iron oxides, uh, much like we have on the surface of Mars. And so does this implicate that we could look for a similar geological structures right here uh, on Mars, and I think so. I, I'm arguing right now in a paper that we should do just that, that with our rovers, we could look at, at geological systems just like this one. Um, but Borup Fjord Pass, the field site where I've had the benefit and the blessing to travel to, is also intriguing for another 
analogous reason, not just for Mars, but for Europa, a moon of Jupiter. So here's another image. And again, if you look in the center, you see those orange dots again, those are our tents um, to give you an idea of scale here. So this is a very large valley with a glacier in the central region of the valley. And just to the south of the glacier uh, is the formation of this ice with this yellow coloration moving down through the valley where it stays yellow and then slowly turns back to white as it becomes eroded down through the valley. What you're looking at there is elemental sulfur forming at the surface of this glacier. It comes up from underground, deep underground, as sulfide, as hydrogen sulfide, uh, which is the smell of rotten eggs, or if you've smelled uh, around a hydrothermal system or gone to a, visit a volcano in the past, you most likely have smelled hydrogen sulfide. It's a very unique smell. Uh, and we humans are actually better than any instrument at sensing hydrogen sulfide some human noses can sense hydrogen sulfide down to the part per trillion level. Um, the reason for that is that hydrogen sulfide also forms in bogs and it forms from the decay of dead organisms. And so it makes sense evolutionarily that we should be able to smell that very well. But what we were studying here is the microbiology, the organisms thriving in these, these, these sulfur deposits at the surface of this glacier, as well as the geochemistry, the minerals forming here you can see a picture here of my hand as I sample some of that yellow elemental sulfur goop forming on top of this glacier. There's another cartoon here from Aaron Gronstall from his graphic history series showing this site. Uh, among the researchers he has in this version are my friend Dovnik Gleason, uh, Bob Papalardo, who is the primary investigator on the mission launching to Europa very soon called Europa Clipper. Uh, as well as Kevin Hand, a noted scientist for doing research on hydrothermal vent systems, as well as the icy worlds of our solar system. The reason a place like Borup Fjord Pass is interesting for a world like Europa is that we have a system where fluids are coming up from deep underground, moving through the ice, erupting at the surface and creating a new geochemistry for us to study. We see a similar process occurring in Antarctica in a place called Blood Falls. This is in the Taylor Glacier uh, region, the Taylor Valley of Antarctica. Uh, you can see here where fluid, again, is coming up from the subsurface, emerging at the surface. And when it comes out, it changes its chemistry as it interacts with oxygen and forms this reddish color of iron oxide, much like we saw from the acid mine drainage and on the surface of Mars. Here, it's iron in these fluids is interacting and making iron oxides that look like a blood red color, which is why it's called blood falls. But the reason these places are interesting for astrobiology is they serve as analogs for some of the icy worlds, places where we most certainly no time soon will be able to get into these bodies to explore them. For those of you who might be interested in space exploration, perhaps you know already about Europa. Uh, Europa, as I mentioned, is a moon of Jupiter. Uh, it was one of the Galilean moons, the first four moons discovered by Galileo Galilei uh, outside of our own moon. Um, it was one of the first moons discovered around another world. Uh, but Gal uh, Europa is very interesting because it appears from our current data to have a very deep, very voluminous ocean. So the surface of Europa appears like this cracked icy surface that might be something like 10 kilometers in thickness. But then down below that is something like 100 kilometers or maybe more of ocean water, of salty ocean water. That's far more extensive than the oceans here on the Earth. Uh, that means there's more water in all of Europa's ocean than there is in all of the oceans of the Earth. And so that makes us wonder, what could be thriving down there? Is there life in that ocean? If there is life, could there be signs of that life coming up to the surface? Just like at Borb Fjord Pass and Blood Falls, we have potential for fluid to move through the ice and bring potential signs of life to the surface for us to study. But maybe not, maybe that's not happening and we have to get down into that, that deep ocean. We're not close to that right now technologically, but it could be possible in our lifetimes to see new missions developed to go down there and start studying these deep systems. Perhaps we'll find, just like we have here on Earth, hydrothermal vent systems. Since the 1970s, we've been discovering around the world these these vent systems on the seafloor where 
ocean water is brought down into the oceanic crust. It's heated up by the mantle down below. And when it comes back out, it brings with it metals and high, uh, high temperatures, the energy, the chemicals for life as we know it. And around these hydrothermal vent systems, we find things thriving. We find organisms thriving, like these long Riftia pachyptala, these long tube worms, uh, or albino crabs and albino shrimp and, and other creatures. Truly, life on Earth finds a way to thrive in nearly every environment it possibly can. For those of you who might be interested in hydrothermal vent systems, I do want to mention my show, uh, Ask an Astrobiologist, this Friday uh, at 10 Pacific Time, 1800 UTC. I'm going to have Dr. Jeff Wheat join me for the show. Uh, Dr. Wheat has gone down to the ocean floor to study those hydrothermal vents uh, over two dozen times in submersibles. Uh, he's taken samples of vents uh, of these different regions from the seafloor to better understand the biological and geological, the chemical processes occurring inside of our ocean. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can find more about that by looking up Ask an Astrobiologist. Uh, you can watch the show live on Friday on the NASA Astrobiology Facebook page or on the Astrobiology, uh, NASA Astrobiology YouTube channel. But what if life can't start in hydrothermal vents? This is kind of a new idea as well. Ever since we started finding those hydrothermal vents in the 1970s, a lot of people quickly said, well, life on Earth must have started at hydrothermal vents. But recently in astrobiology, two researchers named Bruce Damer and Dave Deemer have proposed a new idea uh, that maybe life cannot start in oceans, that maybe Europa and Enceladus and other ocean worlds, maybe they can't have life because we need life to have a dry land environment, specifically cycles of wetting and drying that can happen on dry land. And so they formed something called the Biota Institute to study these processes uh, occurring here on Earth at the surface in things like geothermal systems that we find all around the planet um, in many different countries, we have geothermal systems. This is my favorite one. It's the one I've been to the most personally. Uh, this is Grand Prismatic Spring up in Yellowstone National Park. It's an eight hour drive away from me. So I, I love to go visit this spring. Uh, you can see people standing here on this boardwalk, uh, tourists who have come to admire the beauty of this hydrothermal or this geothermal vent environment. And you see this coloration, this, this beautiful green and yellow and, and orangish red occurring around the outside of this, this, this hot spring. And all of these are being caused by organisms, by microorganisms who are thriving in the hot spring on the energy from the hot spring, the chemistry from the hot spring. And the pigments inside of their, their cells are what's causing these colorations. And even more cool, if you travel to this place throughout the year, it changes color a little bit based on the time of the year. So in the wintertime, there's far more green. And in the summertime, it's more orange and, and yellow um, because of the change in the temperature, the change of the chemistry of the environment around it. These organisms, and indeed many of the things that we find in these analog system environments, they are what we call extremophiles. Uh, and we call them that because they live extremely relative to us. Um, so that's very anthropocentric to say, but it is kind of true. So most things we think of as extremophiles now are extreme relative to humans. Um, but there are some really intriguing ones out there for us to study about the potential for life in space. Chances are you've heard of tardigrades or water bears. They've kind of become the rock star of the extremophile world, really. Um, and they are what we call polyextremophiles. They can survive multiple extremes, including extremely high doses of radiation. They can survive very acidic and very basic fluids. They can also ex survive extreme desiccation. They can lose most of their body's fluid, most of the water, and they crumple down into a small form. And then once they're re-wetted, they can come back to life again. Um, it's rather incredible. And so looking at tardigrades makes us wonder, you know, what can life out there do? You know, we have these analog systems on the earth that kind of tell us some of the things to look for out there on worlds like Mars and Europa and other places. We also have creatures from around our planet, things like that saphonophore, the Portuguese man of war, or that, that deep subsea crustacean, the deep sea isopod. We also have tardigrades that make us wonder what are the limits of life? What can life do? And indeed, I mentioned one thing that drove me towards astrobiology was was science fiction. It was dreaming and thinking 
what is possible. Uh, and so I love to always make sure I point out too that we have to remember that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence as Carl Sagan once said. When we start going off into the universe to look at other worlds, we, we have to remember to be diligent and rigorous in how we approach the science and how we approach our understanding. Because honestly, our generation, those of, those of you right now, myself, we might be amongst the very first human beings to discover that we're not alone in the universe. And that is an extremely huge thing for our species. It may very well change how we envision ourselves as beings, how we understand what it means to be human here on the earth. And so we have to be careful in how we approach things, which is why the field of astrobiology, I think, is growing so well in its support and its understanding and the number of students from around the world who want to, to explore and learn and research in astrobiology. So I'm going to transition here a little bit into talking about um, some careers in astrobiology and some interest in astrobiology that people have. Uh, for instance, Charles Cockell has a class on astrobiology on Coursera uh, that's had well over 70,000 people enrolled over time in it. More recently, uh, my, my friend Siddharth Pandey, who leads the Amity Center of Excellence in Astrobiology uh, at Amity University, uh, brought together an online course of 795 students for an introduction to astrobiology course uh, to meet my fellow researchers in astrobiology and to learn about astrobiology. And, and one thing I really love from that course uh, is Kat Herrera, who's uh, a Guatemalan uh, young scientist and researcher. Uh, she created this graphic of how to say astrobiology with the 36 different languages that were spoken by all 795 students in that class. Uh, perhaps some of you right now recognize more than one of these languages, um, many different ways to say astrobiology. And indeed, uh, for India, I speak to students all the time. I, I'd say at least once a week, I have a student reach out to me to ask what they can do to be involved in research, how to build a career uh, in astrobiology. I meet a lot of young Indian students. I believe India is going to be a leader in astrobiology in the very near future, which makes me very hopeful as well. And so if any of you are interested in building a career in the realm of astrobiology, um, outside of being involved in research in any realm, and I will mention, you know, if, if you earn an undergraduate degree in botany, you most certainly can still be an astrobiologist. And I'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, there are lots of ways to be involved in understanding life. When it comes to understanding biology, there are a lot of questions yet for us to answer. We certainly don't know everything. And so there's a lot of places for all of us to work together. And so I have four general suggestions I'm going to share here, a little bit more information on each one. Uh, the first one is be a generalist as well as a specialist. I also want you to think about owning your own learning, building your network and finding the right people to connect to, the right mentors to help guide you forward. And all of these things sound very general because they are. They apply to far more than astrobiology. For instance, being a generalist as well as a specialist in the realm of astrobiology, but really any scientific endeavor, it's important to be a specialist, to know your specific research, your specific research questions. Those of us who choose to pursue master's degrees and PhDs, we spend years of our lives becoming the world's experts in a single, a very small topic. And by doing that, by becoming the expert in that little topic, we help to build all of human knowledge. But we're learning more and more that the breakdown of science into so many sub-disciplines has also somewhat been problematic. It's led to a lot of scientists not speaking to each other with the same language, with, with the same kind of jargon and, and wording that they use in their different sciences. For many years, we had people who studied biology who weren't speaking with chemists. And those people weren't speaking with astronomers. And they weren't speaking with, with physicists or philosophers or historians even. We need people to be generalist in their understanding of the world as well. And so if you're interested in careers in astrobiology, there's a great website from NASA Astrobiology uh, at astrobiology.nasa.gov. Uh, you can find their career path suggestions page that kind of lays out some way to get involved. And one of the best things to start off with is if you're interested, learn a bit more, check out some podcasts, YouTube videos, 
maybe check out some of the, that, that Coursera course or some other ways to learn about astrobiology. And if that really does intrigue you, you can go on to the process of earning a degree. Now, as I mentioned, your degree can be in any field. It can be in botany or zoology or medicine, in physics, philosophy, history, sociology, psychology. There's so many people we need to come together to bring their understanding to bear in the question of what life is. Our quest to understand the nature of life requires all of us together. So whichever field you, per you pursue and you become a specialist within, and whether or not you choose to pursue graduate studies, perhaps you choose to go work in industry uh, or work for a zoo or a museum uh, or in any other kind of pursuit in your life, you still can be an astrobiologist. You can still think like an astrobiologist and ask questions in astrobiology, and you can be involved in the conversation because especially now in the pandemic, we're learning that we are a global civilization. We are connected online. I give talks to people around the world every week through Zoom and, and Teams and Google Meet and all of these different applications. And so we are connected and anyone can be an astrobiologist. Now, something else that's important for, for your learning in general as a student is to own your learning. Remember that no one is here to hand you your learning. You need to achieve it yourself and earn it yourself. And you should never let a formal education get in the way of your own learning. It's important to pursue university, to pursue your degree, to pay attention to what your professors have to say. They spent a lot of time thinking about these problems, but you also have to make the connections outside of class. You have to do the work and the homework and the reading to bring things together. One thing I also recommend to students is to think about their own time, to know how to be aware of their limits of what they can and can't do, to know how to say no um, to some things, to know when to say yes to some things, and how to delegate their time appropriately. If you spend five hours a day on Facebook, that's not a great use of your time. But maybe 20 minutes each day on Facebook and five hours each day reading a book is a great use of your time, as you would learn down the road once you see what kind of knowledge is achieved in Facebook versus reading. I also think you need to build your network, your community. And again, this applies to far more than just astrobiology. To become well-respected in your field, to become connected in your field, to develop your career moving forward, you need to have a network to fall on, into. And so in astrobiology, we have connections throughout all of the space exploration industry, uh, amongst space sciences around the world. And so there are various groups you can connect with in India and in, in the UK, in the US, in Canada, and all over Europe, in Australia. There are many groups who are involved in astrobiology, in the space sciences, that are great to network with to build yourself uh, into the future. Uh, also, if any of you are interested, we have a program at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science called the Young Scientist Program. I am the director of this program. I'm also one of the mentors. Each summer, we bring on students from around the world to join us for the summer for a research program. This past summer, we had 325 applications from 46 nations. Um, we had a very large number of people join us for the program in, in a very uh, intriguing number of projects. Uh, some of these involve things that looking at iron bearing minerals interacting with RNA. One was looking at the geochemistry of Lake Sauda in Turkey. Um, I have a project on communicating topics in earth and space science. One that's very relevant to botany was our Space Agriculture Laboratory Analysis Database Project or SALAD project. At Blue Marble Space, we have an action group called Plants in Space that is very focused on astrobotany. Uh, you may or may not be aware, but there's a very large realm of botany that applies to space exploration. People have been doing experiments on plant growth, on seed germination, in microgravity, on the space station, on satellites. We've also looked at growing plants in Martian regolith, in the Martian soil, uh, in lunar regolith. Uh, how do we change the environment in which plants grow? And maybe more importantly, how can we feed humans with plants in the future? And so a very active realm of space exploration is to understand astrobotany, how we can provide for our astronauts. Uh, perhaps you read recently that the astronauts on the International Space Station uh, recently grew chili peppers for the first time. 
on the space station and they use those chili peppers to make tacos on the space station, which is a very cool way to use astrobotany for the humans. Uh, I myself am involved right now in a very intriguing uh, science and art uh, collaboration through Super Collider with an artist named Lucia Mange. Uh, she and I are working on a project around the topic of plants in space and specifically how plants tell time uh, in, their, in their growth cycles and how that relates to us humans and our psychological interactions uh, with, with plants that we grow in our greenhouses. Uh, so if you're interested in that kind of research, in being involved in a research project online remotely, then you might be interested in checking out the Young Scientist Program at Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. The new projects for next year will be announced in February uh, of 2022, so keep an eye out there as well. Um, and then I also mentioned that I think you need to find the right mentors, the people who inspire you to dream bigger and think bigger, but also who help you to know what's realistic, what you can do, and who can help you make the connections you need in your thinking and in your professional career to become the kind of scientist and thinker and actor you wish to be in the world. For me personally, when I see something like the blue marble image, it inspires me to think more about all of us together and about our future here on earth, not just our personal future, you and me, in the next you know, few decades, but our future as a species. What does the next century, the next millennium look like for humans? What does the ne next millennium look like for all of the plants that we know right now, for all of the microbes, for all of the animals, for all of these organisms that we share this beautiful world with? And the thing is, we understand now that we could very well destroy ourselves if we're not careful. And so I mentioned earlier that now is a beautiful time. It's a beautiful time for astrobiology because, again, we very well could be the first humans to find out whether or not we're alone in the universe. It's also a very beautiful time because as we've stepped away from our cradle and out into space, we've realized how precious, how fragile, how unique and beautiful we all are. And so for me, astrobiology, it's more than just understanding analog environments. It's more than just my career. It's more than just how I try to impart knowledge on future generations. Astrobiology really is all of us together. Uh, so I thank all of you for listening to my presentation. As I mentioned, I love to make sure I leave lots of time for question and answer. If you have any questions in the realm of astrobiology or other things I spoke about, uh, I welcome you to please ask those questions. I'm more than happy to answer. You are mute, Dr. Ruchi. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Graham, for enlightening us and our students with this wonderful talk. Actually, there are few questions that are asked by our students and our students ourselves want to I means they want to interact with you so the students uh, who wants to interact with dr graham they can switch on they can just raise their hand so that we can unmute them and meanwhile there is a question from our third year student called bg matthew he wanted to ask you that Europa lies outside the Goldilocks zone of our sun so how can liquid water exist there Mm. That's a very good question, BG. Um, so for those who are unaware of what BG asked me, the Goldilocks zone, and, and BG, I really appreciate you using that term. I prefer that term over what some astronomers use, which is habitable zone, um, which is actually not very accurate scientifically. Uh, the Goldilocks zone for liquid water is a region around our sun and around other stars um, where due just based to the orbital dynamics, the orbital position of a world around a star, its potential, uh, it has a potential to have liquid water at the surface of its planet. And so here on Earth, we have oceans at the surface of our world, and we are inside of the Goldilocks zone. 
the way this works, if you are too close to the star, the temperatures are much higher at the surface, so high that liquid water cannot persist, it evaporates away, uh, it boils away at the surface. And if a world is too far away from its star, it's outside of the Goldilocks zone, then uh, the water will freeze at the surface and make an icy crust at its surface. Um, now the Goldilocks zone itself only tells us about the orbital dynamics. It doesn't tell us about an atmosphere. Uh, so for instance, if we find worlds like Venus out there around other stars in the Goldilocks zone, they might be very hot at the surface, much like Venus, and there will be no liquid, liquid water at their surfaces. And so just because a world is inside the habitable zone does not mean it will have liquid water. Uh, likewise, if you take mercury and you put it in the, habitable, in, the, in the the Goldilocks zone, it also will not have liquid water at its surface. It doesn't have enough volatiles, enough material to become liquid water. Now, to your question, Europa is a moon of Jupiter. Uh, it's five times further away from the sun than the Earth is. And so, yes, Europa is well outside of the Goldilocks zone in our solar system. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, Europa does not have liquid water at its surface. Uh, Europa has a very thick icy crust. It's so far away from the sun that the surface is extremely cold. Uh, the temperature roughly of dry ice, it's, uh, it's very cold, actually colder than dry ice. It's, it's more like liquid nitrogen. Um, at the surface, it's very cold. But then down below that thick icy crust, we have a region where we've detected what appears to be a salty liquid fluid um, based on how that world has interacted with Jupiter's magnetic field. Uh, so much like our Earth produces a magnetic field, we have a dynamo inside of our planet formed by our liquid outer core of metal spinning around. Um, Jupiter also has a magnetic field, has the biggest magnetic field of any planet in our solar system. And as Europa is inside of Jupiter's magnetic field, it is actually interacting with the magnetic field in a way that shows us that there must be some conducting fluid inside of Europa causing this. Uh, and we have good reason to think it's not a liquid outer core, uh, but rather based on how it interacts, it shows us that it's most likely a salty liquid, uh, most likely water that makes this large ocean. Uh, and we're gonna find out a lot more about that with Europa Clipper, which should launch in 2024 uh, it should be out to Jupiter and Europa before 2030. Um, it still depends on the rocket. It's very likely to go on a SpaceX rocket. Uh, it should get there before 2030. Uh, and that, that spacecraft will orbit around Europa and Jupiter together. It'll give us much better mapping of the surface of Europa, but it'll also have instruments on board to help us get a much better idea of the full extent of that ocean, uh, as well as the salty nature of the water in that ocean. But yeah, very good question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I see a now, question in the chat here um, from Poolkit. Yes. Um, Poolkit asks, uh, what roles uh, are Earth-based observatories and computer models play in understanding the geology of other worlds? Um, the answer to that is, is so much. It's very important that we have uh, ground-based observatories here on the Earth and space-based telescopes as well. Uh, for learning about other worlds out there. Um, some of you might be aware, we now know, we, we confirmed the existence of over 4,500 exoplanets. These are planets around other stars. When, when I was a child, when I was born, we didn't have evidence of any of them. When I was a kid, we didn't know that for sure if there were other planets around other stars or not. It seemed likely, but we didn't know. And now we know that there are many of them, so many, in fact, that our current estimates suggest that there's more planets than stars in our galaxy. There might even be roughly two planets per star in our galaxy, maybe even more than that. We're only just now finding the, the planets that are out there. And most of the planets we found so far are very large or are orbiting very quickly around their stars. And so there's a lot more for us to learn there. And so for us to try to understand the geology of these other worlds, it takes a lot of our knowledge of of stellar processes, of astronomy and astrophysics, uh, of the formation of worlds. Uh, our knowledge of the formation of planets has changed markedly since we started discovering exoplanets. But finding those worlds alone, we don't actually have the technology yet to look at their surfaces. 
we don't have the technology yet to really understand the geology occurring inside of them. We're just now starting to look at the atmospheres of these alien worlds from far away. It may be a place where we can find signs of alien life, um, but it's also a place where we now have to work together in our knowledge of the geology of our Earth, of other worlds in our solar system that we can use as test beds to better build our models, our computer models, for what these worlds might look like. Um, so so the, to answer your question, these are very important things. Uh, there are entire realms of astrophysics um, dedicated to trying to model exoplanets. Thank you, sir. Sir, will you permit us uh, and our student to interact with you directly by switching on their camera and ask them question themselves? They will feel uh, great in interacting Absolutely. with you. Yeah, okay. Please. So, uh, first of all, my colleague, uh, Dr. Savinder, would uh, talk, uh, like to talk to you and ask you something. And then I request my students and other colleagues to just raise your hand so that we can unmute them and they can uh, 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 talk to you directly. And uh, our students are actually uh, BG and uh, Pulkit, they are thanking you for answering their question. Thank you very much, sir. So students, you can just uh, raise your hands if you want to interact with sir directly or else I can read out your questions posed by you uh, on the chat box, in the chat box. Dr. Savender, over to you. And thank you, Dr. Ruchi. Good, good evening, sir. And uh, when I get to know that uh, a webinar on uh, astrobiology is going to happen, so the one question which always stuck in my mind since last 10 years, so now this is the opportunity for me that I can ask that question. Sir, it's almost more than 40 years, if I'm not wrong, then we have sent our Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. So, and I hope that in next four or five years, they will stop sending the, their signals and we will not receive any information from those, those spacecraft. So now, is there any other plan by NASA or any other space agency to send similar kind of things so that even in future we will keep on, we can hope that at least one day we will have a signal, we will receive a signal from other species, will interstellar species or from other planet or other solar system or even from other galaxy. So I, I, I want to know this particularly. It's a very good question and, and your question, it touches my heart in a special way. Um, unfortunately, we are not currently building more Voyagers. Um, and for those who are listening, it has been four decades that Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 have been traveling. They were launched together in 1979 for the very specific reason of trying to capture a very unique alignment of the outer planets. So during the mid-1980s, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were all going to align in almost a straight line in such a way that we actually knew that we could send a spacecraft to pass by all of them. And we wanted to take that opportunity to get something sent out there as fast as we could. And so the intention of the Voyager spacecraft was to do the, the, this, this, this grand travel, this grand trip um, to go explore these four outer worlds. Uh, and so Voyager 1 went out and went past Jupiter and on to Saturn. It, we decided with Saturn to take a special look at the moon Titan. And because of that, it did a little hook around Saturn and then started leaving our solar system. And then Voyager 2 went past Jupiter, Saturn, and then Uranus and Neptune. Uh, Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft that has ever passed by Uranus and Neptune. We've never sent any other spacecraft to them. Uh, everything else we know about them comes from, from telescopes here on Earth or in space. Um, but yes, the Voyagers have persisted for so much longer than their missions. They've continued to send messages back. You can log into the Deep Space Network, uh, which is run by NASA JPL. Uh, and if you do it at the right time of day, you might actually catch a time of day when you can see the data from Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 coming into one of our three telescopes. Uh, there's one in the US, one in Madrid in Spain, and one in Australia uh, of the Deep Space Network. They're positioned. Uh, such that they can catch the signals at any given time of day around the world. Um, and it's beautiful. When I, whenever I see Voyager 1 connecting and, and communicating back home, I, I almost cry. It's, it's, a, it's a, almost a religious experience for me. 
um, to feel the connection, to know that, that we are receiving and, and accepting the data that Voyager is sending to us. And you're completely right. We think maybe five years at most. Honestly, it could be longer. They might last longer. Um, the batteries have lasted very long. Uh, so both of these spacecraft have radioisotope generators inside of them, radiothermal isotope generators inside of them, um, plutonium pellets that are breaking down and releasing energy. And over time, that exponential exponentially decreases the amount of radiation being emitted, and thus the energy keeps falling off more and more. And so we are losing them. But on them, we have these Voyager golden records, these signs that if they meet an extraterrestrial intelligence, they might actually get to know something more about who we are and what we are. And one thing I love the most about them that a lot of people don't know, the Voyager Golden Records don't just have pictures and sounds on them. They also have a coating, a, a radioactive coating around them um, that is a date. It, it, it would tell an intelligent alien species exactly the year, the exact time uh, that we launched those spacecraft because it's also breaking down in radioisotopes. And through, through the science of, of, of how uh, radio dating works, if they'd have that science, they could understand this process. So I'm, I'm very sad that we're not sending more Voyagers because you know, maybe, maybe we will find signs of technological activity. And so in astrobiology, we look for biosignatures, signs of life, but a very specific form of biosignature is called a technosignature. Now that could be radio communication from the alien species. It could be something like a Dyson sphere, um, you know, purported or, or, or hypothesized by Freeman Dyson in the 1950s. Um, perhaps an alien species could grow technologically sophisticated enough to create a spherical structure around their entire solar system to capture all of the starlight from their star. Uh, and if so, they should be radiating energy in infrared. Uh, and so maybe we'll find one of those. There's a lot of things that we're looking for now. There's a whole realm of technosignature research, uh, and it involves things like the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, looking for things like industrial gases and exoplanet atmospheres. And so it's a huge realm of research, but, but I am very sorry to report that currently we don't have any plans for more Voyagers, unfortunately. Does it mean, sir, that we have to wait for next 120, almost 125 years when the planet will be in the same align, uh, alignment? So I, do I we have to wait for I, I, I hope not. I, I, hope, I hope that we choose to send something sooner. Um, there are other spacecraft that have traveled as well. So we sent Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. They were also to go out and explore more in the outer solar system. Um, their batteries did not last as long. Uh, there's also the New Horizons spacecraft, which is still communicating. Uh, and New Horizons is traveling very fast. It went past Pluto uh, and then another Kuiper Belt object. But New Horizons will eventually die as well. Um, and so I would love it if we built another Voyager. Um, specifically, as we build more technologies, it would be nice to launch a series of these spacecraft in different directions away from our star. Um, so it's not for astrobiology, but for astrophysics to better understand the space environment. Um, Voyager 1 and 2 are still within our solar system, but they are in interstellar space. And the way we know that is they're now being impacted by the radiation from other stars just as much as our star. And if we send them in different directions, we can actually measure the stellar environment around our solar system. And that would be really good for us to know from the standpoint of physics. So it means we can only hope that in near future, we will see the Voyager 3 or something like that. Thank yeah, you, sir. Voyager, Voyager 3 through Voyager 300. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> That's really great, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for answering, sir. Uh, now, uh, my students want to interact with you. Uh, Dr. Zishan, can you just uh, unmute Dorji first? Yes, no, I'm doing. Hello. Uh, good evening, sir. Dodgy, you can switch on your camera as well. Okay, ma'am. Uh. 
uh good evening sir oh. uh, it's it's a very pleasure to uh, see you uh, and i am actually a third year student uh, under the under the guidance of our uh, great professors and uh, it's an honor to meet you and i uh, since my uh, since my young age i have a very one uh, curiosity in my mind uh, that as an astrobiologist uh, uh, i believe like uh, the main aim of the astrobiology is to study about life right sir uh the origin of life how the life originated and how the life is processed but uh is it possible for the astrobiologist to uh explain about the death because i believe like death is a very important part of a life so if astrobiologists are able to explain about the death then is after life we we say like in after life is it possible to explain after life that is my first question sir it's a very interesting question dorji Uh, I will say so. So you know, we humans through time have wondered: Is there something after our death? Is there an afterlife? And it's certainly a question that kind of is not you know something that we approach scientifically. Uh, it's something that we, we approach you know from the standpoint of our our belief and our, our understanding of our place in the world in the universe. Um, for me personally, I, I don't personally believe in the the concept of afterlife. I, I do think that when I die, that I'm gone. But for me, I, I think the beauty of it is that. There is a rebirth um, of our elements that is kind of profound. Um, inside of our bodies, we have atoms, elements that were formed during the Big Bang. Uh, you have hydrogen inside of you that was formed 13.8 billion years ago in the Big Bang, and we have materials in us formed inside of the cores of stars through billions of years of stellar evolution. But we also have, you know, more recent uh, uh, formations of atoms. uh things like carbon 14 forming in the atmosphere through cosmic ray bombardment you have atoms inside of your body as well as do I as well as do all of us that were formed through atomic bomb testing uh here on the earth by humans there is a te te techno signature a sign of technological activity even though it's a saddening one it is the testing of nuclear weapons uh we all carry the remnants of that inside of our bodies elements of carbon that were formed in that process and when we do die when our physical bodies are gone those materials go back to the earth and i find that to be very beautiful and maybe even more so long from now long after our civilization has gone in hopefully different directions and hopefully started to populate the universe uh our world cannot survive forever um and so one day our star will grow potentially to the size of earth's orbit Uh, and unless we choose to create a spaceship the size of the earth and take it with us our earth will be gone and so those elements will be scattered back to the universe potentially creating new life elsewhere and so not only do we all share the same elements and believe it or not a lot of the elements inside of you get cycled back each year into the oceans and into the atmosphere uh through various cycles so that we all end up sharing a lot of the same atoms over time and sometime very very long from now some part of you some part of me might very well be inside of another creature who's looking at the stars at night and wondering what else is possible and so for me that that's that's what i think of as the afterlife it's it's my rebirth in the form of new life far far away from now oh sir and i uh, and i always uh, heard that the scientists the modern scientists they usually don't uh, believe blindly they would only believe if it uh, if they are able to observe through the naked eyes and also if they can feel it or if they can touch it right sir so if uh, if sir if you uh, if your after after birth uh, explanation is sort of like uh, based on the atom then uh, as for uh, as for a religious matter for a buddhism or a hinduism we usually have a, a lots of uh, stories or lots of proof uh, to explain that he or she a, a little child who are able to remember their uh, before life right so how is it possible that is there any correlation uh, between uh, that and the scientific way of explanation of after life sir yeah i mean so there are there are lots of ways of understanding um you know our our religious experience of what it means to be human is not necessarily entirely different from our scientific understanding or our philosophical understanding these are different tools that we've developed to understand what it means to be human 
here on the earth. Um, now, you're right, as a scientist, I am very much a skeptic. Um, I do like it when I have evidence. And if you can give me enough evidence to convince me that there, there are signs of evidence of reincarnation of rebirth, um, you know, I would consider that hypothesis. Um, it's just what, how science works. Science is one of those things that is always changing based on our knowledge, you know, and, and we have different kinds of experiences. I have experiences because of my knowledge of science, of what it means to know how a star functions, what it means to understand the process of Rayleigh scattering in our atmosphere that allows us to see a sunset. Um, and as Carl Sagan once said, it does no harm to the beauty of a sunset to understand a little something about it. But that said, I still have a very human, almost spiritual experience when I look at the sunset and I take a moment to experience being in that moment. I'm also a meditator. Uh, I practice meditation and I teach meditation. And I've had experiences while meditating that I cannot explain scientifically. However, as a scientist, I remain skeptic and I'm willing to promote hypotheses, but I also do expect, again, that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, my final question is actually uh, based on the uh, current event, uh, because I'm also a great fan of Elon Musk, as, as we all know that he is the founder of SpaceX and uh, Starlink and many more. Uh, sir, um, I have one, it, it's sort of like a simple uh, curiosity, like, uh, do you believe like Elon Musk and Kimball Marx, uh, his brother, uh, who is also working on the uh, food related issue as uh, the Brooklyn NY based uh, vertical farming? Uh, uh, both of the brothers, uh, their sole uh, aim is to colonize the Mars, right, sir? Uh, Elon Musk, his sole motto is to uh, go to the Mars and then Kimball Marx is to uh, aid his brother for the food related issues. So, sir, do you really think like, uh, is it possible for them or maybe uh, uh, for them to colonize the Mars and uh, will it be able to, uh, will we be able to uh, move with them in one day, sir? Is it just my oh. curiosity? <laughs> I'm happy to answer. So, um, Kimball actually used to live here in Boulder, Colorado, down the street. <laughs> um, he, he actually still owns a few restaurants that I've been to yeah, um, yes. down the road here. Um, but I'm glad you brought him up because most people only know of Elon and not his brother um, who's done... He's also an incredible chef. He's a world-renowned chef um, and owns many restaurants and is also involved in this idea of a future of humans settling Mars. Um, both Elon and Kimball had the Musk Foundation many years ago. Uh, they gave the Mars Society funding to build an observatory at the Mars Desert Research Station out in Utah um, to build a telescope and a small observatory for the analog research base where humans go in a mock Mars mission um, we actually have these now around the world. We have MDRS in Utah. There's the Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station in Canada. There's the High Seas Research Base out in Hawaii. Uh, there's a few uh, throughout Europe and Asia and Africa. Um, and very soon, hopefully, there will be one in India. Um, in northern India, we'll have a, a Mars analog base as well. Um, and there are a lot of us around the world who want to get humans to Mars. And as an astrobiologist, I do want to know, was there ever life on Mars? And so you will hear an active debate right now in the realm of space exploration and astrobiology. Should we send humans until we, you know, before we figured out whether or not there was life there? Personally, for me, I want to send humans now to Mars and start the process of human exploration. Um, we have some incredible robots that we sent there. Mars is the only world that we know of that is only inhabited by robots thus far. Um, but we can send humans and one geologist on the surface of Mars could do in one week with a laboratory what we do with our rovers in a year or more. Um, because of our training, our knowledge and how we use our hands and our tools and our instruments, there's just a lot more I think we could do scientifically on Mars with humans. And so for me personally, I, I think we should send humans now and start the process. And yes, I, I do think we actually could settle Mars. I think we should settle Mars. I think we should expand not just our species, but our biosphere. So it's, it's not just us going to Mars, it's our plants, it's animals, it's microbes, it's all of the things that dwell on this planet with us, helping us to slowly seed life elsewhere and build new biospheres and new worlds. Uh, and so I would love to see a future with Mars becoming a world and, and populated by life as we know it. Now that said, I'm also part of a group who argues 
for the preservation of wilderness on Mars. Uh, here on Earth, we have different places. We've created wilderness preserves. Different governments and world agencies, the UN, has set aside places on the Earth as designated sites for preservation to maintain the wildlife, to preserve the geology, to preserve ecosystems. I think we should do the same thing on Mars, that we should have certain areas of Mars that we designate that humans do not go there and that we preserve those areas as pristine as we can, as Mars was at one time for ancient human beings um, to give us a connection to how our ancestors looked at the red planet. Um, maybe one day it won't be red anymore, but I think we should still preserve some of that for future generations to see as well. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, I hope our students are not taking much of your time. Actually, they are bubbling with questions. <laughs> they are so excited. Uh, so can I ask you more, sir? Absolutely, please do. Okay, sir, uh, my student from uh, third year, Amritika, she wanted to ask you, can Marina Trench be considered uh, as sorry an... Sorry to this, ma'am. Right. Uh, I think we can unmute uh, Amritika also. She can ask directly, right? If she is right. willing to. Srota, you can also raise your hand and BG as well, because you have asked the question. Kindly raise your hand so that we can uh, unmute you. I have unmute, uh, unmuted uh, Mritika. Mritika, Mritika, can you? Please. Yeah, uh, Mritika, please uh, unmute, unmute yourself, switch on your camera and uh, interact with sir directly. I think she is not in the meeting right now. We can. Ask no, uh, she she has written in the chat box. No, I am not muted yet. Uh, I am not unmuted yet. Doctor Sishan, kindly check. Yes, ma'am. Her name is not visible actually. Please take someone else till then. Yes. yes. Uh, uh, you can unmute uh, Preeti Matpal. Okay. So uh, meanwhile, I can ask uh, Srota's question because she said that she has got a lot of background noise, so she cannot switch on her, uh, uh, she cannot unmute herself. So, sir, the question of Srota is, will change in the atmosphere of one planet affects the geology of other planets? It's hmm. a very interesting question, uh, Srota. Um, if I understand your question, you're asking if a changing atmosphere of, say, like the Earth or Venus would affect the geology of its neighbor. Um, if that's the case, given the current physics that we know of, I would say the answer appears to be no. But that also kind of depends. There, there could be extreme situations. Um, perhaps if planets, you know, become too close to each other, or it's early in a solar system's history, and they're about to collide. Um, but in general, no. So uh, planets, you know, the worlds of our solar system um, are so very far apart that very little actually uh, happens to the atmosphere of one planet affecting another. Um, so that there should be no immediate impact on the geology of one planet should the atmosphere of another change. And a good example of that very much should be Venus. Um, Venus, you know, and I often say this to people, if there was another world in our solar system that had life at any point in history outside of the Earth, I would say it was probably Venus. Long ago, Venus, we think, very likely had oceans. It might have had a, very much an atmosphere like our Earth. 
it maybe even had a period of plate tectonics very similar to our Earth that recycled parts of the crust. We, we don't really know because it appears that the surface of Venus melted out um, roughly 500 million years ago, perhaps more. Um, the surface, almost the entire surface melted. And then there was rampant volcanism afterwards. But Venus has also undergone a runaway greenhouse effect. Its atmosphere uh, has become so endowed with greenhouse gases that it traps infrared very, very well. Uh, Venus is extremely hot at the surface, several hundred degrees Celsius. Um, water would boil away in, in, a, in a moment at the surface just right away. Uh, it rains sulfuric acid in the Venusian atmosphere, but it's so hot at the surface that the, the sulfuric acid re-evaporates before it hits the ground. Uh, so Venus is a world that's undergone a very extreme change in its atmosphere. And to our knowledge, that hasn't at all impacted the geology of our planet. Um, and so it's a very intriguing question. Uh, and it's one that I, I don't want to say absolutely no, um, because again, the, you know, as if one thing exoplanets have taught us, it's that all we need to do is travel out into the universe and learn more about it to discover that we're wrong. Um, and so who knows, maybe there is some extreme case out there where it has happened. Um, but for our solar system, the answer is most likely no. Thank you, sir. Um, Ritika, you, uh, I have unmuted you. Please switch on your camera and interact with sir. Sir, our students are thanking you. Well, thank you all for, for, for joining me this morning. Um, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all so far. Ritika? Sir, I think there is some network uh, problem with... Oh, okay. Ritika is back. So my question is that Mariana Trench can be considered an environmental analog and uh, can we uh, take it as... Uh, um, uh, find it in other exoplanets. Uh, so, so the Marianas Trench, um, for those who don't know, is the deepest place on our planet in the ocean. Um, and it is a very intriguing analog because it provides us the deepest place of ocean water to study. I mentioned earlier, for instance, Europa has an extremely deep ocean, uh, much deeper than the Marianas Trench. Um, and yet the trench gives us a good place to study very unique biology to the Earth. Um, so many of you might know that, that, you know, at first, many people for a very long time, they thought the abyssal plains and the trenches of our planet on the seafloor would be devoid of life, that nothing could live there. And now we're discovering a large number of organisms who've come to survive in this dark, cold environment on the seafloor where there's very low nutrients um, a lot of organisms that use bioluminescence, very cool looking creatures that are kind of mind blowing and almost alien looking themselves. And people have now traveled down into the Marianas Trench and, and have sampled some of the living things down there. And so again, biology, life finds a way on our planet. Life loves to thrive in any environment it can find suitable. And the trench is no different. And so the trench is a very good analog for high pressure fluid environments. It's a good analog for very dark, cold, wet environments. And so it's a great analog for Europa, Enceladus, potentially for Titan if it has an ocean. Um, and honestly, it's very likely there are other worlds out there that will have similar trenches and ridges in their oceans as we do. Um, so for those of you who have studied some geology, you might, might know, and if you don't, um, our world is composed of several different tectonic plates. Um, and actually, indeed, the formation of the Himalaya happened because the Indian plate shifted to the north and crashed into the, the Asian plate, and it drove the Himalayas up and formed this humongous mountain chain, which is also now eroding down. Uh, and the process is still occurring. The Indian plate is still colliding um, with the continental plate. Um, there are several plates on our planet and some small ones as well all around. And as they move around and shift, they're kind of forming these regions of our ocean where we have trenches, these deep holes, 
in, in these various subduction zones and these these trenches where we have large ridges coming up where we find those hydrothermal vent systems um, it seems entirely likely that there must be other worlds out there that have a similar system of tectonism of tectonic plates um, maybe not the same geology may, maybe different geology because of their chemistry um, and that most likely would lead to different biospheres if life is possible but I would very much love in our lifetimes, if we can develop the technology to image alien worlds out there, I would love to find out that there's a world that has apparent tectonic plates and oceans, because then as, as someone who loves the ocean, I would immediately think there must be trenches, there must be ridges, and there, there must be similar things to what we see here. Thank you, sir. It's like Kepler 186F that are more similar to Earth. Is there not a higher chance of finding life there instead of uninhabitable planets? Yeah, I would caution. And in, in, so sometimes when you, you see the news and you, you hear, you know, one of these exoplanets reported as being very similar to the Earth. What you're, what you're hearing about is that we've discovered a planet that's in the Goldilocks zone that's very similar in size to the Earth. And that's usually all we can say. Um, we can't even say if it has a solid surface. Um, some of these worlds might be gas planets. They, they, they might be gaseous giants that migrated into the Goldilocks zone and are slowly losing their atmospheres. Um, there's a lot we don't know about what those worlds are. And so they could be Earth-like. And, and that's a very important thing. It's part of why a lot of us want to look at those worlds specifically to target them for our searches for biosignatures. Um, however, you know, if there is life here in our solar system in Europa, for instance, then maybe worlds like our Earth are the least likely to have life out there because they might be the hardest to form and the hardest to persist through time since there are so many potential things that can happen to an Earth-like world to hinder it from having life. Whereas if you have a, a, a world that has life in the subsurface, in, in a subsurface ocean, it may be very well protected from outside influences. Um, that said, I do think it's very important for us to look at the worlds that are in similar orbital uh, positions and sizes as our Earth. They are a very good target to start with. Um, but I, I think, you know, once again, once we got into the universe, we, we always learn new, exciting things that change our thinking about our place in the cosmos. And I would not at all be surprised if that's what's going to happen down the line as well when it comes to our explorations of worlds like the Kepler-186 and others. Thank you so much. And I love the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Preeti, you can unmute yourself and uh, switch on your camera good evening sir and sir thank you for interacting with us and i have to say that the slides are beautiful and the way you explain is on another level sir so my question is have uh, as you have traveled to such an extremes of the habitats like high acidic condition alkaline ph with temperatures so sir have you feel some uneasiness with your body or we can say human body can be a hindrance while exploring such extremes? Very good question. Um, so first off, yes, our human bodies, we have evolved to a very specific environment here at the surface of the Earth. And so for instance, going to space, space is not an environment meant for the human body. It's why we need spaceships and, and space suits and things like that. And when we go down to the, the ocean floor, we go down in submersibles. Um, and when you're scuba diving, you're wearing a wetsuit and, and, and scuba gear to allow you to find your buoyancy down in the ocean and, and to see the fish down there. We, we, don't, we don't naturally thrive on the ocean floor. Um, that said, you know, there, there's something to be said that, that challenging the human body to extremes. Um, there's a lot that it does for us psychologically and physically um, to challenge ourselves, to push ourselves into extreme environments here on our planet and elsewhere. Um, and honestly, you know, when I've traveled a lot, I, I've, I've gone to places, for instance, like high, high elevation. One, one reason I love living in Colorado, I, I like being around mountains and I like to travel to mountaintops. And 
Uh, it's one reason my, I grew my meditation practice and, and meditated more is because it helped me to learn the breathing techniques that helped me to never experience altitude sickness. Um, and to help myself, if, if I'm feeling out of breath, I know how to calm my, my breathing and I, I have exercises that help me with that. Um, but that said, there are some things that still, regardless of how much you want to train, how much of a suit you wear or other things, it still feels wrong. And my best example is in the Arctic in the summertime, the sun does not set. The, the sun never goes below the horizon. It just does a big circle in the sky. There is no night. And that might not sound that bad. Um, certainly there are human beings who live in regions very far in the north, near or above the Arctic Circle, uh, people who live very far in the south, um, who have you know, periods of the year in the summer where there's a lot of daylight or in the winter where it's dark for a very long period of time and there's not much daylight. But when I was up in the high Arctic, that far above the Arctic Circle, so that there was no darkness whatsoever. After a few days, my body started feeling very uncomfortable. It was very difficult to sleep. And I didn't feel like I was, I was experiencing human. I didn't feel like I was experiencing my, my normal rest period. I actually had to meditate on the glacier for a period of time to, to find some rest. Um, I mean, even sleeping in my tent at night, the tents are built to absorb solar radiation to keep you warm, but because of that, they're very bright. And so it was very difficult to find darkness while I was trying to sleep. And so that was a very weird feeling for me. And I remember the very first time I came back and experienced the sunset after my, my, my experience in the Arctic, uh, I was in Canada uh, in the city of Ottawa and I experienced the sunset and it was one of the most powerful sunsets of my entire life. Because when the sun went down below the horizon, I finally felt that, that human instinct again, that my biological clock was back in sync with the earth and the orbit and, and our, our revolution with our sun. And, and so everything felt right again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, teachers. I, I do have to say it is getting rather late here in Colorado, so I think maybe one more question. Okay, uh, so uh, Fezan, you can just switch on. Sir, uh, can you take two, please? Just two. You can explain. I will, yeah, I will, I will try to explain quickly. <laughs> okay, so Fezan, you can just uh, turn on your camera and uh, interact with sir. Sir, our uh, attendees are requesting in the chat. So please attend my question too. Please, sir, you tell us what to do. So you can share your email uh, with us so that uh, our students or attendees, they can uh, directly send you the queries and you can answer them there. Right, sir? Okay. Fezan, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, sir, my question is that, sir, uh, entrepreneur like elon musk want to shift human species on other planet of the solar system like mars so sir my first question is that why mars and the second question sir is that sir if they want to save human species from like uh, like from this uh, disaster like maybe an asteroid may come on earth so it may be possibility that uh, Ma mars also faces this problem of asteroid. So this may be a worthless for shifting a new shifting a human species on the other planet. So what is our or your review on that? Absolutely. Um, so uh, so two things there. One, Mars is easy, um, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, so Venus is closer. It actually is easier to travel to Venus than it is to travel to Mars. Um, and so we, if we wanted to send humans somewhere to, to build settlements, then you would think Venus is the best place to go. But again, Venus has that very hot surface. It's very thick atmosphere. Venus is not a place where we can easily send humans safely. Whereas Mars is, you know, we, we know that we can get to Mars. We know we can land humans there. It's close. And so Mars is the, the next best candidate. It's the best place for us to send humans if we choose to explore on foot, uh, on the ground of another world, um, beyond our Earth and our Moon, 
Uh, and it's also, again, it's easy. We, we can put an analog base or a, a base there. We can land our spacecraft there and launch again. There are resources there too. We're testing in situ resource utilization, ISRU, of how we can create rocket fuel and oxygen and other things we need on the surface of Mars. So in, in general, the answer is it's easy, but it also it inspires us. You know, we've looked at Mars in the nighttime sky. Our ancestors looked to Mars. They looked to that, that point of light in the sky and, and wondered what that was. Even the very word planet, the very first use of the word planet comes from Mars, from the, the, our ancient people seeing that Mars appear, appears to shift in its motion in the nighttime sky compared to the stars around it. Um, they actually noticed this of several planets, but Mars was the most marked for them to see. It's called retrograde motion. Um, and it was one of the things that inspired ancient peoples to wonder what these other points of light were and to create the word planet. Um, so Mars is easy, but it's also inspiring. Um, now, as far as, you know, say we could have natural disasters on Mars um, or natural disasters if we go to Venus or Europa or we, we put human bases in asteroids. If you've watched the Expanse series, you've seen that they have all these different asteroids inhabited in different space stations. Um, the thing is, if a global catastrophic disaster happens here on the Earth and we don't have anyone living elsewhere, then that's it. But if we do have civilizations, you know, set up on Earth and Mars in Ceres and Vesta and Pallas and Europa uh, and Titan and all these different worlds, then our species is more prepared. If something happens to Mars or something happens to the Earth or something happens to Europa, it means that we actually do have that potential. Uh, and so you're right. There's just as much potential for, for a global catastrophic disaster on Mars uh, and maybe even more so in the early years. But uh, I think it makes sense for us to start spreading our biosphere out to other worlds. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graham. And uh, now, sir, last question. Uh, it, it is one of our ex-students who has joined the conversation and would like to interact with you. Hans Raj. I have unmuted you. Kindly switch on your camera and mic. Good evening, sir, and good evening. Uh, good morning, ma'am. So uh, the, my question is like, uh, it is a kind of idea. You can critique on this because I don't know if, if it is uh, possible or appropriate or not, that uh, we have carbon-based life. And we are searching uh, life on the other planets on the basis of the environment we have here. Uh, Carbon-based life exists on uh, uh, Earth because of permutation, permutation combination of some environmental conditions on Earth. So uh, it is like a puzzle which have been fixed and making sense because of permutation combination of the environmental and other reactions which uh, make uh, it possible to create a life on Earth. So is it possible that uh, uh, like uh, we can create because with the help of artificial intelligence to create a life on other planets because they have a different kind of uh, environmental conditions. So is it possible to uh, um, make possible to fill that puzzle to make a life possible and it is not based on carbon-based life like we have right now? Interesting question, Hansraj. Um, so, for, so silicon-based life is this idea. So, so life as we know it is based on a backbone of carbon. Um, carbon molecules, carbon very easily forms four atomic bonds with other, other atoms, specifically with carbon. Um, so carbon can make long chains of carbon molecules that have lots of carbon atoms, like these long hydrocarbons and our, our fats, the membranes that make up our cells and things like that. Um, there are other atoms that can do that too. I love sulfur. Sulfur makes long chains of sulfur atoms as well and could also be a backbone, but those bonds are very weak. Um, there's some other boron actually creates boron chains, um, but silicon, if you look at the periodic table, silicon is right below carbon. And so not only does it form four bonds just like carbon and it forms long silicon chains, it also forms fairly strong bonds compared to some of these other molecules or these other atoms. Um, now that said, they're not as strong as carbon bonds. So carbon bonds are still far stronger Due to the electronegativities of carbon and how they how they react together, um, there are far stronger bonds than silicon-silicon bonds. 
which is an argument against silicon life happening out there in the cosmos. But we know that we, the, we look at it now where we're creating, you know, we have machine learning right now and we, we have artificial intelligence, but it's not quite the science fiction level of artificial intelligence that some of you might think of yet, but we are going in that direction. We may eventually have super intelligent artificial intelligence. Uh, and even on my show, I, I had on Dr. Suzanne Schneider. Uh, she's now at Florida Atlantic University. She's a philosopher who studies the philosophy of mind and the future of artificial intelligence, specifically super intelligent artificial intelligence. And what happens in that future? And the truth is, you know, and, and you ask, like, is it possible? And I'd say anything's possible. The question is, what's probable? What's likely to happen? And I do think we will create silicon based life forms here on Earth specifically our machines, our, our computer-based life forms. And one thing I love in science fiction, it allows us to then ask the, the ethical and spiritual and religious and societal questions that we need to ask about how do we react and how do we relate to that life and share being alive with that life. Um, I love Star Trek The Next Generation, for instance, and one of my favorite episodes of that show is an, an episode where they debate the legalities of the, the personhood, the right to existence of a silicon-based living being. And, and I think that the power of that episode for me was it made me think ethically about what does it mean for this life? You know, should we respect this life? And, and I think the answer obviously is yes. We have to understand it as life. Um, but also since, since we can imagine ourselves making super intelligent, artificial intelligent life and silicon-based life, a very intriguing and potentially scary idea then is that if we can do it, then maybe other species have already done it too. And maybe there are super intelligent artificial intelligences out there right now. And if that's the case, then we have the other question, how do they think about us or how would they think about us? Will they be benign um, or perhaps beneficial? Will they, will they bring us gifts and teach us about the universe? Or will they be uh, very bad for us? Will they choose to destroy us, to devour us, to use our energy and our molecules? Or might they be something even more scary? Might they be so far advanced beyond us that they don't even consider us alive? And that they don't mind obliterating our entire planet or species with the flick of a hand practically because they don't think it's of value to them. And, and the answer is, we don't know. We don't know if that's possible. We don't know if it's happening, if it's probable. Um, but it is, it's in a very interesting realm of astrobiology where we start some, asking some of those bigger what if questions. Um, you know, we can take what we know of science and then start applying our knowledge of philosophy, psychology, and, and ask those bigger questions. But it's a very interesting realm of thought. And one that I, I highly, I highly suggest that you read up on because there's a lot of stuff that we're learning there right now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. By the way, our, uh... Uh, your conversation was very nice and you are very kind. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Graham. Uh, sir, uh, thank you very much for sparing so much time, at particularly at this hour, US time. And uh, I hope you have uh, liked and loved interacting with our students, bubbling with question and energy. And now I would like to invite Dr. Zishan to propose a uh, vote of thanks. Thank you very much, sir. It, it was lovely interacting with you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation for the webinar. It was such an exhilarating experience to listen about planetary analog and the possibility of life in space. Thank you for interacting with the students. I must say they might have very encouraged and will try to explore their career options in astrobiology as well. And thank you for sharing so many career options and the opportunities where they can uh, read and where they can study about the subject matter. And I'm also thankful to our officiating principal, Professor Sangeeta Pandita for all the necessary facilities to conduct the event. Thanks are also due to all the faculties of Department of Botany for the support and guidance. Last but not the least, all the students and other attendees who are the main source of the motivation to organize such kind of event. Thank you all 
for the participation in this event. Thank you, Dr. Gram. Thank you very uh, much. Before we close the meeting, I would request everyone to switch on the camera so that we can have one group photograph. So please switch on the camera and one group photograph. That's it. Dr. Ruchi, can you take the uh, photograph? Or anyone? Dr. Zishan, we need to change the settings so that stu students can switch on their cameras. Yeah, yeah. Can you do that? Yes. Apologies, Dr. Graham, for keeping you up for so late. That's okay. I think it was a great success of the webinar. They were so excited. I was not very hopeful about so much of excitement. Well, you and, had some wonderful questions, and all of you. Especially, ma'am, some of the questions that they have asked, it, it shows that how much uh, webinar has impacted their mind and helped them to understand and uh, uh, means I, I think it is great for them to uh, listen to sir. Yes, please go ahead now. Take the uh, photograph. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'm taking. Some of the students can also take. Mritika, you can also take the pictures I'm taking from my mobile phone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, Dr. Lau. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure speaking with all of you. I hope you all have a wonderful day. It, it is nighttime here, so I'm going to go to bed. Um, but I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.